And now a reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning with the 21st verse. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Amen. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. Lead the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Come Holy Spirit, come we pray. Amen. Who is this Jesus? I hope that in asking that question to a congregation where many people have been in the church for decades is not offensive. I hope it is received as an invitation to go deeper, to give greater consideration, to think more about who this Jesus is to each of us, no matter where we are in our faith journey. Although... Being offended occasionally in worship is not necessarily a bad thing. After all, the gospel many times confronts us. It challenges us. Jesus had a way of offending the masses, of upsetting the religious status quo. And if that was the way of Jesus, then we who seek to follow in this way should expect this from time to time. Sometimes it's good to be unsettled or made uncomfortable. Yes, even in worship. I would hope that we are astounded and amazed not by a sermon or by a Sunday school lesson, but by Jesus, his life, his teachings that are proclaimed and lifted up in a sermon, in a hymn, or in the daily reading of Scripture. If the gospel only comforts us or tells us what we want to hear, then have we fully understood the claims the gospel is making on us? And have we heard the demands that come with seeking to live in a rather particular way that Jesus taught and continues to teach us today as his disciples? If we're only comforted, then perhaps we have picked out only what we like and what we want to hear from Jesus. Maybe we only see Republican Jesus. Maybe we only hear Democrat Jesus. And just this far into the sermon, I've already gone to meddling, have I not? See, we like the Jesus who who pauses to welcome children, to bless the children, to bring healing to people, who feeds the hungry and assures us that there are so many dwelling places in the heavenly realm that there is a place for each of us. We love that about Jesus. Give me that Jesus. But the one who flips over tables and asks us not to throw stones and tells us to deny ourselves, well, that may be too much from time to time. If we're only comforted and not astounded, then maybe we have made God after our image and not the other way around. Or we have made up our minds on how God works in the world and we're going to limit what our response will be. I recall offering a prayer in worship on a Sunday morning where I quoted Reinhold Niebuhr, who is attributed with the saying, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, although I think that saying actually predates him. And I got a letter from a church member that week who was taken aback by that prayer. He and his wife were so shocked to the point that they opened up their eyes, they looked at each other in disbelief, and they stopped praying. Initially, they were unsettled. How dare I encourage such a thing? And I'm glad he didn't write that letter on Sunday afternoon. But later in the week. 
See, it said it made him think. And in the letter that he wrote, he had hoped that I would continue to offer sermons, or in that case, a prayer that would make him uneasy and uncomfortable, or even offended him as he needed as much as he sought to walk by faith, and as he sought to grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I hope the question, who is this Jesus, is an invitation for us to consider what we already know about Jesus, yes, what we've experienced already in Jesus, but I hope it's an invitation for us to consider, is there more? Is there more that Jesus is wanting to offer us? Is there more to this thing called living the Christian life? And what needs to, then to be transformed in my life, my behavior, is my way of thinking? What is required of us as we seek to walk by faith? I hope the series on who is this Jesus is received as an invitation to consider what is next. What is next for me? What is next for our, my family? What is next for your small group? What is next for this community of believers here at Great Bridge? Who is this Jesus and what is Jesus asking of me, teaching me, requiring of me and calling me to do? In this season after the epiphany, I hope we're open to the steering of the Holy Spirit. I hope we are free to experience a day of deeper understanding and open to divine revelations with eyes of faith wide open to be ever aware of how God is seeking to be made known and is made known whenever we open up the scriptures, whenever we dine together at the table of grace, when we're in the singing, in the sharing of the peace, when the community gathers and we're able to see Christ in each other, and when we're able to see Christ in the other. I hope that our worship and church life hasn't become so routine and predictable and predictable and ritualistic that we fail to take notice of the ways that God seeks to disrupt, the ways that God comes among us and brings forth healing and renewal, at times bringing peace to us in the midst of the troubles we are facing and at other times disturbing us that we might be so disturbed to be awakened to work for justice and to offer mercy and show loving kindness to all. Oh, to be so astounded and amazed by Jesus and not simply intellectually stimulated by a teaching or entertained by the music or captivated by something new, a gimmick or or the charisma of anyone who takes part in worship. You know, I don't want us to be able to check off that box on this fourth Sunday in January of this new year and say, I've got perfect attendance for the year, and then get back to whatever it is that we want to do as we pursue life and leave unchanged by the love and the mercy and the grace of our Lord. I don't want people to leave here this day saying, you know, that was a, a really good sermon, Pastor, or I don't want you to leave here going, that sermon was meh. But rather, I hope that people see not me, but the cross. Well, I had a cross this morning. I don't know where it is now. (laughs) That cross that, if I stood behind it, is before me. In our worship, we're all invited to experience more and more of Jesus and be found like the disciples sitting at the feet of Jesus, leaning in and, and listening to the great teacher who is also healer, savior, friend, Lord, I'm not offering anything new and refreshing on any given Sunday morning. I'm not going over the top with any sermon I've ever preached, but I hope that time after time that we are invited to get to know our Jesus, to come to know Jesus when we open up the scriptures and to grow in our Christian discipleship as we consider what does it mean to live as a disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. I hope we're invited to learn from Jesus, to dine with him at the table of grace, to experience the very presence of the Holy Spirit and to experience the blessings that come when we get lost. I hope we do. I hope we get lost in our worship, to get lost in wonder, love, and praise. 
And so on any given Sunday, I'm aware that there are seekers among us, there are believers among us, and there are also doubters among us. And so wherever we are, we all have our thoughts and we all have our ideas and beliefs about Jesus. And what we believe truly matters. It matters what we think about Jesus, what we believe about Jesus. And if we are never astounded, if we're never amazed by the love and grace of God, then we'll go unchanged. And we need to ask ourselves then, what are we doing on a Sunday morning at Great Bridge Church? In the season after the epiphany, we would do well to be open to the ways God is trying to get our attention. And so how are these ancient words of scripture, how are they becoming a living word among us? And what part of our faith needs further exploration? What part of our faith needs to be nurtured this day? And what do we need to let go of so as to let more of of God in? You know, through the years, I have encountered several people who understood Jesus to be that great teacher, to understand that Jesus was just a a great moral example, the, the best moral example there ever was, to live as a human being. But they have a hard time believing much of what we just said when we stood and we recited the Apostles' Creed. And these conversations haven't taken place outside the church, but in the church by people who've been at the church ever since they were a young child cutting their teeth on the pew before them. Son of man seems easy enough for people to believe. But son of God, the word made flesh is hard for some people to wrap their logical, rational minds around, even as we go all out celebrating Christmas even in the midst of struggling to accept the incarnation of God. Same can be said about how people question how God could suffer and die on the cross. That that was just human Jesus. There's no God there. People wrestle with that. And the resurrection, well, that's hard for many people to grasp as well. But when it comes to the grace of God, we would do better to stand underneath that wide, all-encompassing canopy of grace than to try to understand it all. I mean, mean, such is a gift, and instead of trying to, to explain it all away, we would do well to accept the gift and enjoy how the gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, can transform our lives, can transform our community, can transform our church. That is where the authority and the power of Jesus lies, in the ability to transform. In the story of Mark's gospel, we see Jesus as one with authority as he brought healing to a man with an unclean spirit and transformation takes place. Now, in the church, we say a great deal about Jesus and throughout the year, we'll focus on certain aspects of his life, certain times of his life. We'll focus then also on what he taught, the parables, or or taught about the kingdom of heaven, the the miracles. We'll lean into those miracles, and we'll see time and again how Jesus would would draw the circle, ever widening that circle of grace to let more and more people in. And and some of what Jesus taught, it, it can be easily accepted, while others have to be accepted by faith by experience, by a divine revelation, by the Holy Spirit who's at work convicting us. When you think about it, we can offer the gospel as a sharing of facts, as simply offering information. When what really matters is what we believe about Jesus and how Jesus has the ability and the power to transform our lives. What made Jesus such a great teacher was that this teaching was not just authoritative, but his teaching had power, the power to transform. Marcus Borg in Vision, Jesus, A New Vision, writes, Jesus was not primarily a teacher of correct beliefs or a moral of right morals. Rather, he was a teacher of a way, a path, a, specifically, a specific way of transformation. 
And so, yes, when we open up the scriptures, we might start with information. We might start with our curiosity and our series of questions. We may start in worship or we start in service and mission. And we seek then to understand the Bible, the story of Jesus, and the very nature of God. And each time we do so, more and more is revealed. And we understand more and learn more, something about ourselves and about God and our need for this loving God. Answers we find lead us to further questions and that desire to to want to know more. Our beliefs are not founded on information we've been able to glean about Jesus or by simply reading the biblical narrative about Jesus. See, not everyone who opens up the scriptures becomes a believer in the same way that everyone who opens up the Koran and reads the Koran doesn't become Muslim. Our beliefs and our curiosity should lead us to be open to be transformed by the grace and the mercy, the love, the very presence of the living word among us, this Jesus. Oh, to be so astounded. Oh, to be so amazed by Jesus this day. You know, our gospel lessons in this month of January or in this liturgical season after the epiphany, they all take place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so we have gone from Christmas. We've gone from the beginning when when God sent Jesus into the world to live among us. And then we moved to the epiphany, the visit of the Magi, as we celebrated how God didn't send Jesus just to a select few people, but God sent Jesus for all people. And then early in January, we remembered Jesus' baptism in our own baptism as that signaled the beginning of this Galilean ministry. And then each of the lessons we have been attending to this month, they have revealed something about Jesus and who this Jesus is, something about his identity. And this progression of learning who Jesus is and what is revealed about Jesus each lesson should be our experience, not just in a sermon series, but throughout our life of faith. The more we've experienced and come to know about him, the more we should avail ourselves to be open to the ways that God is at work today. In the story in Mark, the setting takes place in a synagogue, and not just on any given day, but on the Sabbath day. And we might tend to skip over those details, seemingly that they're insignificant, but we must understand when it comes to Mark, his gospel is quick. Everything's immediate. He doesn't offer a lot of detail, but when he does offer detail, we should pay attention to what is trying to be conveyed. We might just say, this story is only about the healing of, of this unclean spirit. We may think the story is about healing, and that's the most important part. Yes, there is a healing, and this reveals Jesus as one who has power over that which binds another, and Jesus comes to set people free. But it also is a story that reveals that Jesus is teacher, and those who are to follow him are to be his students, his disciples. The unclean spirit declared who Jesus was when others in the room were simply astounded by Jesus' teaching and were trying to figure out what it all meant. A miracle happens, and yet there is no immediate declaration of faith. People were in awe, but there's no demonstration of faith at all. Rather, they're left with a question at first, what is this? And this story suggests that it takes us a lot longer to figure things out about who this Jesus is as sometimes we might be slow to learn and and too focused upon what we can see or too troubled by what's going in our own life or too overwhelmed or underwhelmed by life to be astounded and amazed by the way Jesus shows up. In the Gospel of Mark, we see how unclean spirits immediately knew who Jesus was, not just in this story, but in other stories as well. They were able to see and know who Jesus was immediately. Those who were following him 
much slower to learn. And I say this not to point out the faults of those early disciples, but to point out that this is so much of who we are in our human condition. Sometimes it takes us longer to recognize the holy or to sense the movement of the Holy Spirit. We simply need time. We need longer than a worship service or an occasional worship service. We need more than just attending to daily devotions for one week at a time, but attend to those devotions over and over and over again. To live by faith and to be transformed by grace, we repeatedly need to put into practice that which helps us see, helps us to take notice of the ways that God is at work and to experience the holy. See, Mark tells us that what happened in Capernaum occurred on a rather particular day in a rather particular place. And that day was the Sabbath, and the place was the synagogue. And that setting is such that it is a holy day, the Sabbath, a day considered to be holy unto the Lord, and the synagogue, a, a sacred place where the people would gather to listen to the scribes teach to hear the word read and proclaimed and to pray together. And so there in that place and on that day, the stage is set for what was to be revealed. And in that holy place and on that holy day, Jesus is revealed as the Holy One of God. And such is declared by the unclean spirit but it's also revealed as Jesus is not just any teacher, but he is the one who taught with authority and with a power to transform. Today, we have gathered on this holy day for many Christians view Sunday as a holy day as it marks the day that Jesus rose from the grave. And we have gathered in this holy place in the sanctuary as a community of believers to worship the holy one of god to experience the loving grace of jesus christ we have gathered from different places in our walk with jesus we've gathered with all many different circumstances and situations that we've been fa facing in life and jesus the holy one of god is able to meet each of us right where we are for jesus has the power to transform our life and give us a future that is filled with hope who can come in and change our brokenness and lead us to the places of shalom wholeness and transform our seasons of despair and doubt into seasons of hope. Oh, to be so astounded and amazed this day by the Holy One of God who comes among us. Amen. Walk by faith.